Chris Hensley is a registered representative of Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., a broker-dealer member of FINRA, SIPC, investment advisor representative of Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor. Cambridge and Houston First Financial Group are not affiliated. Good morning, everybody. You're listening to Money Matters on KPFT Houston. I'm Chris Hensley. The time is now 11 a.m., uh, which is what I'm so used to saying. So I'm trying to break that habit since we're broadcast, we're we're archiving and and uh, pre-recording now. We're not live, but I just got that habit of saying that every time. So uh, w- once again, we are recording from uh, the 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 extra bedroom in my house, uh, and so there is the, the podcast will go out up to this, uh, but there's also a YouTube version which we've been putting out uh, really since all last year, starting in March. Uh, of last year. So if you are a long term time listener, you know, we always reserve just the first few moments of the show to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the Houston area when it comes to financial literacy. Uh, I was hoping to have an update for you on Houston Money Week. However, uh, the the monthly meeting that started this month was scheduled the same week that we had the winter freeze here in Texas. Uh, and so most of the people were without power and lights during that week. So I don't have any <laughs> updates for you, but I do encourage everybody to go to uh, HoustonMoneyWeek.org. That is the, the initiative, Houston Money Week. Uh, it's a, a nonprofit organization that provides financial literacy workshops, educational uh, forums to uh, really anybody in the Houston and the Gulf Coast area. As we get closer to April, uh, we've got city, uh, stay, our city, uh, local government uh, uh, partners here. But one of the ones I like to highlight as we get close to April is the VITA program, which does free tax preparation for low to moderate income. So anybody that's interested in the Houston area of finding out more, you can go to HoustonMoneyWeek.org. And if you're looking to volunteer, uh, although instead of going out to the work side or to the uh, organization, a lot of this stuff is being done virtually now, which is our topic that we're going to talk about with with Bruce in just a moment. Um, uh, so, so just a way to, to think about that. But uh, Bruce, you have been waiting very patiently here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Chris, thanks so much for including me in your show. Absolutely. And so uh, the, we're going to talk, we're going to kind of do a deep dive into your book that just came out, uh, The Art of Being Indispensable at Work. Uh, but this is kind of a twofer for, for us because the way the way that you got this book got pointed out to me is that there was a book that was released this month from Harvard Business Review guy called The Guide to Remote Working. And yes. that that kind of got on my radar because everybody is having to, you know, come back and think of different ways to work with teams and work remotely and all of that. And I wrote then, the uh, I wrote the introduction to that. Yes, yes. So <laughs> before I, 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 I will pivot and we will get right back into the new book, The Art of Being Indispensable at Work. But I, I would like to ask you a little bit about that because you did the introduction in there. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how uh, tell us a little bit about remote working and how you frame that in there? Yeah, I mean, so we've been doing research on the front lines of the workplace for 27 years, and uh, we've worked with organizations of all shapes and sizes. And I can tell you that remote work is a trend that has been developing now for decades, and especially in the last decade as technology has improved. But of course, um, in the last year during the pandemic, uh, so many people were forced to go remote. Now, let's remember, Lots of people were unable to work remotely because of the nature of the work they do. Uh, But so many people were forced to go remote. And, you know, I think the first phase of that was a lot of people thought, gee, you know, how are we going to do this? And they had to get their ducks in a row. They had to figure out their workspace. Organizations had to figure out their protocols. I think the second phase was that a lot of people realized, hey, wait a minute this is working just fine. It turns out there's lots of work that can be done remotely. More work than we realized can be done remotely pretty well, pretty fast. In some cases, uh, productivity and quality is improving, morale is improving uh, because people have additional convenience, additional flexibility, additional comfort, and it turns out, you know, 
they're able to do a lot of their work uh, from home after all, and they're able to stay in dialogue with their colleagues uh, remotely. Uh, I think the third phase was when people started to miss each other, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> yeah. people started to realize, gee, you know, maybe something is missing here. Um, and, and it's, you know, some of the intangibles are missing. Uh, just how we energize each other when we're nearby each other. Um, how we, sometimes we compete with each other. We notice each other. We have spontaneous interaction. You know, that some of that, you know, so people are realizing what's what's missing. And I think where we're headed now is, uh, you know, people are trying to figure out, okay, so what have we learned and what are we going to do going forward? And I think an awful lot of people are going to be doing at least some of their work uh, remotely uh, now for the foreseeable future. It's like we skipped 10 or 15 years of evolution in this trend. You know, we just skipped over uh, and, and this trend is now uh, uh, accelerated. And I don't think we're ever going back to work the way we once were. So I will just put a big exclamation mark next to that because I totally agree uh, my, my personal financial planning practice, uh, I had, and I work with retirees, 65 people uh, and up, uh, getting people to come to technology for out of city or geographically located separate from, from Houston uh, was always a roadblock. Um, but from you know from the beginning of this to now not only have people been accept you know uh, uh open to this uh but this has been the preferred method for everybody <laughs> so so i i literally saw that tra transform in the past year here so can't say enough about that uh and you did the the intro for that book the hbr guide to remote working so i'm gonna pivot now and i usually i'm kind of doing things a little bit different because most of the time i'll introduce you right at the beginning uh but i'd like for listeners bruce is uh, the best-selling author and, and advisor to business leaders all over the world and a sought after keynote speaker. Since 1995, Tolgan has worked with tens of thousands of leaders and managers in hundreds of organizations ranging from Aetna to Walmart and from the U.S. Army to the YMCA. Now, he lectures at the Yale Graduate School of Management as well as other academic institutions. Tolgan's books include the updated and expanded edition of Not Everyone Gets a Trophy and the best-selling It's Okay to Be the Boss. Uh, Bruce, once again, thank you for joining us. And the book that we're going to it's kind a of privilege. And by the way, I know you're in Houston and God bless you and everyone there. And I, <laughs> I hope you all are safe um, and have uh, power and have what you need and, and that you made it through OK. We are we are up and running. And uh, the worst. See, I'm very uh, thankful. The worst thing that happened is we had a faucet head that just shot off the side of the, uh, the house. Uh, Texas is not made for cold weather, at least Houston. Uh, but we're we're going to do a deep dive into the the book, the art of being indispensable at work. And so one of the things I wanted to to ask you about is um, you talk about uh, the peculiar mathematics of real influence. Uh, can you tell us what that means? Yeah, I mean, look. So people, if if you look at people in the workplace right now everybody's getting squeezed, right? They, their boss makes demands of them. They're, they're, if they have uh, people uh, whom they manage, they're making demands of them. Uh, they're hearing from people up, down, sideways, and diagonal, inside and outside the organization. I mean, most people feel like they have too much to do and not enough time. They're inundated by requests. They have to rely on lots of people, including a lot of people whom they can't hold a accountable easily. Uh, uh, and, um, and, and so people are getting squeezed. And what a lot of people tell me is, you know, uh, so much is expected of me, but I don't have the authority uh, to say no. Uh, uh, to people, and and so and also, you know, I want to be a good team player, so I feel like I I should say yes, and not and 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 what does everyone tell you? If you don't have authority, you got to use influence. And so people will say to me, you know, what does that mean? And and what a lot of people think it means is, well, you know, you better do it. Uh, just get it done, whether you have the authority or not. You know, make it happen for people. If you have to be a steamroller, be a steamroller. Um, you know, uh, it's better to ask for for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And um, you know, uh, and 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 uh, and and you just got to say yes. You can't really say no. And you know, you just got to work smart and juggle. 
uh, and, 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 uh, and play politics in that way, you know, you'll have the influence you need. But I call that false influence thinking. Because when you conduct yourself that way, uh, you might get what you need and you might deliver for people in the short term, but it's no way to do business and people lose confidence in you over time. So when I talk about the peculiar mathematics of real influence, I'm talking about how you show up, how you conduct yourself, how you play the long game of reputation one day at a time. And, and you know, how do you really take a service mindset to your relationships and, and really deliver for people without getting overcommitted, without drowning in other people's priorities? Because if you're drowning in other people's priorities, you know, if you're just steamrolled, if you say yes to everything, uh, if, 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 if you're always juggling, if you're always raising your hand, you, you end up dropping a lot of balls and you end up having unnecessary delays, unnecessary mistakes, a, a lot of relationship friction. I mean, the irony is that a lot of people, because they want to be indispensable, they try to say yes, yes, yes to everyone. They think that's the only way, right? It's like, it's the quid pro quo. I'll do, you know, if I want people to do stuff for me, I can't say no. Uh, and as a result of that, they, 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 uh, they undermine themselves. And, and ultimately, you undermine your real influence. Real influence, your real influence lives in the hearts and minds of other people. Your real influence is your most valuable asset in relationships but it's like a bank account that is in, in everyone else's brain. So the way you build up your real influence is, you know, you really got to conduct yourself in, 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 with integrity, um, with a service mindset, but you have to conduct yourself in such a way that you don't overpromise, uh, that you don't um, uh, juggle, that you don't play politics, uh, that you conduct yourself like a professional and that you treat people in a way that makes them want to come back to you over and over and over again. I love it. I love it. Everything that you just said, great information there. And I think it's really, you know, there's been an adjustment for people having to, you know, leaders who, who are used to, to, to leading or having to do it in different ways. Uh, and so kind of making that what at the end of the day, that real influence uh, that lives in the hearts and minds of others and, and, and being dedicated to service. Um, tell me about, well, one of the things that you write about is that, that, that uh, you, they lead from wherever they are. What do you mean yes. by that? Yes. Yeah, so, so like, uh, just like the conventional wisdom, if you don't have authority, you have to use influence. And I say, don't use influence. Uh, influence is not a verb. It's a noun. Build influence. And then it will serve you. Uh, so another uh, source of conventional wisdom is lead from wherever you are. If you don't have the authority, just do it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, just take action, make it happen. Um, and, and what we've learned is that, um, no, the people who uh, are most successful at working with their sideways colleagues, with their diagonal colleagues, uh, are the ones who first uh, anchor themselves in the chain of command. Right, you gotta go vertical before you can go sideways and diagonal. So yes, lead from wherever you are, but wherever you are is the key. Uh, uh -huh. Orient yourself in context, understand your chain of command. The first person you have to manage every day is yourself. The second person you have to manage every day is your boss. Yeah. And the third person you have to manage every day is anyone who reports to you, right? Uh, you, you've gotta get yourself aligned vertically. Uh, uh, before you can operate sideways and diagonal. If you have a strong vertical anchor, then you put yourself in a position uh, to work uh, with people uh, who are lateral colleagues to take action. You know, what, what ends up happening usually is people work with their lateral colleagues, they get frustrated, and then they go over each other's head, right? Instead, go over your own head early and often. Make sure you, you know the ground rules, you know the priorities. Nine out of 10 times, you would know exactly what your boss would say and your direct report should be able to say the same. It turns out that the stronger your vertical anchor, 
the better able you're, you are to succeed in sideways relationships. And nobody goes over your own head because you're going over your own head all the time. I love it. I love it. So I'm thinking back uh, to my days as middle management, <laughs> exactly. uh, even jobs back in school uh, as a manager. If I, you know, leading by example, if I was going to ask somebody to, to mop a bathroom, then I would show them how to do it first. Now, working remotely, that's hard to do. <laughs> and so the idea of what you just said, the vertical anchoring and the value of, of establishing that seems powerful. It seems really uh, like something that as a leader, somebody who's managing that you have to have uh, to be able to, to do this. Uh, then the, the, another thing that you write about is they know when to say no and how to say yes. Tell us about that. Yeah, because look, you can't say, you want to say yes. You want to be a good team player. Maybe you're afraid if you say no, uh, they'll think you're, you got a bad attitude or you're trying to avoid work, or maybe they'll go find someone else who will do it. And then you won't be their go-to person. They'll have a different go-to person. But you know, look, yes is where all the action is. But if you yes, 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 to please people up front, you end up over-promising. And if you overpromise, you're going to under deliver. You will be known for whether you deliver on your yes. So yes is where all the action is. Don't waste your yeses. And this leads a lot of people to say, well, that means you got to learn how to say no. And I think where that leads people in the wrong direction is I think sometimes people think, well, that how you say no is, well, you know, if you sugarcoat it, then people won't mind getting a no. Uh, no, it's still no. <laughs> they say, still no, they're still disappointed. It turns out that the way to put yourself in a position to have people accept your no's is to have a reputation for making really good decisions. And uh, of course, over the long term, you can have a track record for, for really good no's. Um, but in the short term, the first tactic we recommend, what we see so many people do is Slow down, don't gloss over the ask. Tune in to every request, every ask. So many asks, asks, so many requests are, they're a little bit sloppy. Maybe somebody doesn't realize exactly what you do or how you do it, right? Uh, um, maybe they ask in passing and it seems like a small ask, but it turns out to be a big one. Maybe they ask and it seems like a big thing, but, but, but you know it's actually a small thing. So uh, you got to slow down. Uh, too many people gloss over the ask. They want to please people by yesing them and uh, either yes them to please them, yes them to make them go away, yes them to, to cut off the conversation. Um, so, but if you want to treat other people's needs with respect, slow down, tune in, ask a bunch of questions, take notes. So we teach what uh, I call uh, uh, doing an intake memo. Uh, so, you know, I used to be a lawyer. Lawyers do intake memos. Um, accountants do intake memos. Uh, uh, you know, uh, professionals do intake memos. Doctors do intake memos. So do an intake memo. Really help people fine tune their ask. Slow down. And this does a few things. Number one, it shows them you're treating their request with respect. It shows them that you're careful in how you feel the request and how you make your decisions and it'll help you make better decisions. And, 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 and sometimes the answer is not yet, right? Uh, uh, sometimes the answer is, hey, go back and fine tune your ask. Sometimes the answer is, well, that's not exactly what I do. Let me explain where I fit in this puzzle. But good news, I'm the kind of person who everyone wants to work with. So I have someone you could go to instead of me, uh, or I can set you up with someone. Let me make the, make the connection. Um, when I say learn when to say no, um, it's really applying due diligence, right? So there are three no's that you have to master. The first is if you cannot do something, you got to say, no, I cannot do that. I am not able to do that. I will disappoint if I, if I say yes. The second is I'm not allowed to do that, right? And maybe you're not allowed to do that. And then you're doing everybody a favor. The third is tricky, right? I should not do that. And that's a matter of priorities. And there you have to go back and forth, right? So you go back to, okay, my ground rules, my priorities, my vertical alignment, you know, does this fit, right? And then you're looking at your schedule. Where could I do this? Where, where's my time for this? 
Um, and, and then you also want to figure out, you know, is, am I the right person for this? Right. So you don't want to be saying, hey, that's not my job. But uh, but the reality is there's some wisdom in that's not my job, because sometimes what you're saying is that's not my specialty. I'm not sure how to do that. Right. Right. Uh, and, and, and sometimes what you're saying is I, I'm I've got so much on my plate. By the time I get to that, I'm bound to disappoint you. So the, the that's not my specialty is a way of saying, gee, I might not do a great job at that. I might not be the right person. Uh, or if I were to do this, I'd have a big learning curve and uh, I'm overwhelmed already or I've got so much on my plate already as a way of saying I might I might delay. Uh, there might be delays if I take this on because I've got so many things on my priority list in front of this. Um, and, and so that does lead you to um, to a pretty uh, well thought out no or a well thought out not yet or a well thought out, hey, I'll do this, but I'm gonna have a learning curve on this. I love it, I love it. So it's not just saying no. <laughs> you, you gave us a lot of good information there. The idea of slowing down, really tuning in to the ask, uh, taking really good notes. Uh, you gave us the idea of the intake memo, just like a doctor or other professionals there. Um, and, and then this list of the different, you know, either we can't do it, we're not allowed, I should not do, uh, and ways to kind of approach it and really kind of fine tune. The other thing that we talk that you talk about is is work just working smart. Uh, tell us about working smart. Yeah, so work smart. Some people will say, well, you know, avoid the long cuts, take the shortcuts. Sure, use technology, of course. Uh, you know, work in your area of passion and strength. Well, yes, but who's going to do all the work, right? And uh, so, so look, if you do something you that you're passionate about and you're very good at, hey. It's the opposite of that's not my job. That's my specialty. It means you know the best practices. It means you've got repeatable solutions. It means you've probably got good job aids. So what 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 you're really saying is I can do that for you very well, very fast. I know exactly how to do that. I know exactly how long it's going to take. Right. So so working smart is not just about using shortcuts and using technology um, and 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 uh, but it's also uh, realizing where your work intersects with other people's needs so now look uh, that's not my job is also where hidden opportunities are like oh if that's not your job maybe it should be or if that's not your job maybe this is a new opportunity or if that's not your job, maybe it's just like taking out the trash. Somebody's got to do it. So the reason you say yes is because you don't want to be a jerk, right? But, <laughs> but if right, somebody's got to do it, oh, I don't do that. Really? Why? <laughs> right? So, 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 um, so there's two parts here. One is working smart means um, if you're going to do something, your best uh, case is if you're doing something that's already your specialty. You know the best practices, you have repeatable solutions, you have good job aids, not just to guide you, but to help your internal customers understand what you do and how you do it, okay? But, but then it's, uh, it works smart also, if it's not one of your specialties, work smart. Don't pretend, right? Don't fake it till you make it. Uh, don't overpromise. What you got to do is be really clear. Hey, I'm going to have a learning curve. Let me look into that. Uh, and then if you're going to take something on, make it one of your specialties, right? Make sure you don't make it, don't figure it out on your own. Go find the best practices. Go find repeatable solutions. Uh, go find job aids or build them to help you. And if it's one of those things like making the coffee or taking the, the, the garbage out, maybe you should say, you know what, somebody's got to do that. I'll be the guy who takes the garbage out and I'm going to get great at that. Anything you do, you should professionalize. And anything you do, if you treat it like a professional, right, uh, and that becomes one of your specialties. That's how you expand your repertoire. So, yes, raise your hand. But if you're going to raise your hand for something new, be clear about it. And then don't learn in secret, learn in plain sight. I love it. I love it. So I, I'm a very, uh, somebody, if you're going to do something, do it good. 
uh, that's, uh, that is, you know, inside me, it's not inside of everybody, <laughs> but, but I know when you start something new, it's hard to hold yourself to that standard of making sure you're good at it. And so the things that you mentioned, those job tools, finding experts or people in that area that have, where you're not necessarily recreating the wheel, but you have that, uh, and, and really seeking out that it is, it sounds like a really good place to start when these new opportunities arrive. So if it's not something that's not my job and you're trying to bring it into the fold there make sure you do it well uh, and it could very well be an opportunity for you um, if you're just joining us we're talking with Bruce Tolgan he is the author of the new book the art of being indispensable at work uh, Bruce you also talk about finishing what you start can you tell us about that yeah, I mean, look, so many people are so busy, right? You talk with people now. Uh, I've interviewed a half million people over the last 27 years from 400 different organizations. One of the things I've noticed over the years is, you know, everybody's got more to do than they've got available time, but that's gotten worse and worse and worse. And everybody says, oh, I have so much to do. And, and, and a lot of people say, I have so much to do, I'm always juggling. Well, to me, you know, if you're always juggling, then one thing is for sure, eventually you're going to drop the ball. Uh, so uh, my advice is, yes, you got to be able to take on more and more tasks and responsibilities, have a growing to-do list. But the people who really get stuff done are the ones who uh, set aside time for focused execution. Juggling is not efficient or effective. It, 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 it's one, it's a half step away from multitasking, which is not a thing. Multitasking is a fiction. What brain scientists will tell you is multitasking is actually task shifting. And the human brain is very sophisticated, so we can shift back and forth a lot. But you're much more effective if you focus like a laser beam, even for 15 minutes at a time. Um, and so what I tell people is look at your busy schedule and find the gaps in your schedule. Those gaps are gold. Then look at your to-do list and find chunks on that to-do list, chunks of work, and make a do list. And make sure you do those chunks of work, do them, execute, finish in those gaps in your schedule. So you need time for focused execution and sometimes you got to carve big uh, work into smaller chunks. Uh, you know, you got to eat an elephant one bite at a time, but, uh, but, but you got to bite, chew, swallow. And the only question is how many bites can you bite, chew, and swallow in any sitting? And if you got 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, you've got to make these do not disturb zones for yourself for focused execution. So I, I love it. We are, this has been the fastest show. We've only got three minutes left and I feel like <laughs> we're just getting started here. So, so um, that particular section, finishing what you start, the image that popped into my head is the, the person that, you know, works way over 40 hours a week. Somehow they're coming in on the weekends and working in, in the evening, but they never really get much done. And <laughs> exactly. that's the multitasking that you said, um, it's about, you know, getting it across across the finish line and what you call focused execution. I love that. Uh, giving yourself that do not disturb time um, to, to actually get stuff across the finish line is huge. Uh, Bruce, we've got just a few more minutes before the end of the show here. Um, so one of the things you talk about is go-to-ism uh, and, and people promoting go-to-ism. What is that about? Yeah, go-to-ism, it's the way of the go-to person, you know? Um, so everyone wants to go to you. The problem is the only way to be a go-to person on a sustained basis is if you make sure to conduct yourself as if your time and energy is a valuable asset that you allocate carefully. And then find go-to people wherever you need them. Uh, that means uh, when you show up to them, maintain your service mindset. Uh, and that means be a great customer, go to the right people for the right things, go prepared, uh, give them plenty of time uh, and, and, and be, do everything you can to help them help you. And then build up new go-to people wherever, wherever you can find them. You know, when you, when you realize that you can conduct yourself in a way that gives you a huge strategic advantage, sometimes it's tempting to keep it to yourself. 
Uh, but if you conduct yourself this way, other people are going to want to know what you're doing. And, you know, relationships are where it's at. But don't look, it's all about relationships. But don't get the wrong idea. It's not about making best friends with people. It's not about playing politics at work. When the work goes better and better, the relationships get better. When, when the work goes wrong, relationships suffer. So deliver for people, be a great customer and build up new go to people whenever you have the chance. Uh, I call it go-to-ism. It's the way of the go-to people. I love it. I love it. We're right here at the end of the show. Bruce, uh, for listeners who'd like to find out more about the book, I know it's published through Harvard Business Review Press. Uh, is there a website that they could go to to find out more about you and the book? I mean, the book is available wherever books are sold. Amazon is a good place to get it. Barnes & Noble. Uh, and, and our website is rainmakerthinking.com. Uh, that's the best place to find me. Fantastic. And as we wrap up the show, is there anything that I forgot to ask you that you'd like to share with listeners? Oh, you've been fantastic. But I will quote a friend and client of mine uh, who's a retired major general from the United States Air Force. He was deputy commanding general of the, the United States uh, Joint Special Operations Command. And he put it really simply. He said, practice being the person you're trying to become. And I believe he's uh, he, he is a I know he's a resident of Texas now. So Greg oh, Langell, wow. General, Major General Greg Langell says, practice being the person you're trying to become. I love it. I love it. Bruce, thanks so much for being on the show. Have a good day there. Thank you so much.